All right, so my last lecture really went into the birth of the American labor movement in the late 1800s, and I talked about some of the reasons that it comes into existence during this time. And I also talked about some of the reasons in which it fails in its fundamental goal of achieving better working conditions for your average American worker, right? Um, the late 1800s, as I explained earlier, is this period of unprecedented economic growth in this country. We see a 500% increase in our economic output in the second half of the 1800s. We go from being the fourth largest industrial producer in the world to being the largest um, and actually producing more goods than the three countries that were previously ahead of us combined, right? So we the economic transformation is massive, it's unprecedented. But if you're looking at it from the viewpoint of your average American worker, things are not improving. And in fact, the standard of life for your average American worker during this time period actually declines. But we also see this kind of unprecedented array of new goods being available to consumers. Um, and for the first time in the early 1900s, all of these products that these factories can produce, the distribution networks really finally start to catch up, meaning those goods can now be shipped all the way across the country much more efficiently, and everyone, no matter where you live in the country, has some access to these goods. So even if you're living in the most remote rural area, there's mail order catalogs that you can order from companies that will then ship those goods to your house, right? So everyone has access to the same goods, and this creates what we refer to as the consumer economy, that for the first time, all of these goods are available nationally. And increasingly, as those goods become available nationally, the things that we buy, our consumption patterns, really start to become intertwined with our identity as Americans. But this is also, as I mentioned before, this period of really, really severe wealth inequality, right? Um, I mentioned that 99% or the top 1% of Americans owned more property than the bottom 99% during this time period, but also there was a single financial firm owned by J.P. Morgan. It controlled about 40% of all the financial and industrial capital in the United States. So they, for all intents and purposes, owned about 40% of the economy. And more than a third of the country's mining and manufacturing workers are living in poverty during this time. So there's this very stark distinction coming into focus between your average American worker who is just barely scraping by and these incredibly, incredibly wealthy people. And the American labor movement really starts to try to challenge that. It starts to demand better treatment for American workers. And I mentioned that it doesn't really get a foothold in the second half of the 1800s. It's just not quite working. But as this consumer economy develops and as our consumption patterns really become intertwined with our identity as Americans, what we start to see is that activists on behalf of workers start framing the struggle to reform the current system in the language of consumer rights as well as in worker rights, meaning our access to the goods produced in these factories start to be seen as a fundamental right. And if you are a worker that's not making enough to buy those goods, you're being you're denied your rights as Americans. And through this, through this language of consumer rights, progressivism is able to find the broad base of support that it needs to start being successful. Now, before we move any farther, I should define progressivism and what it means. And basically, all it means is support for or advocacy of social reform, meaning you support changing the status quo in some way to make things better. That's a pretty broad definition. And in fact, progressivism as an idea traces its roots back pretty much to the 
time that the first settlers arrived in the United States, back before the founding of the country. But we call the early 1900s a progressive era because it's unique in a certain way. Because these efforts to change the status quo for the better, they become increasingly focused on putting pressure on the federal government to take an active role in solving these societal problems. I mentioned before when I was talking about Reconstruction that most Americans up to this point really felt it was not the government's job to get involved in social issues. That The government needed to be small and needed to stay out of people's way, but industrialization produces all of these unforeseen consequences, right? That is, the economy grows and more and more economic power gets centralized in the hands of these factory owners, we start to see more and more abuses of that power, and it reflects itself in the crippling poverty experienced by your average American worker. It manifests itself in the epidemic of on-the-job injuries and deaths that are occurring because of dangerous working conditions. And so increasingly, people start to challenge this notion that the government shouldn't get involved because they need to find a solution. And the American labor movement isn't quite getting a toehold. So what are we going to do? Well, the answer is let's start putting pressure on the federal government to actually start taking an active role in solving societal problems. And so we see in the early 1900s a shift in the economic and political philosophies that your average American adheres to. From laissez-faire liberalism, laissez-faire is just a fancy way of saying hands off, right? Government stays out, to modern liberalism, or the federal government can and should get involved when there's a problem facing society, that the government can be a force for good and can fix these problems. And part of what fuels this shift in ideas about the role of government is magazines. Now, magazines have been around for a very long time, but magazines were expensive to print before this. Um, and in order to buy a magazine, you probably needed to be making enough money to have a little bit of disposable income. But they become much more popular in the early 1900s, and part of this is because of this consumer economy that develops. Now a magazine can sell across the entire country, it can build its readership much larger than it ever could, and as it's selling to more people, what they can do is they convince advertisers to give them money in order to carry ads in their magazine because they know it's gonna reach a lot of people. And so they can shift the cost of producing the magazine away from the consumer, the person buying it, and over to the businesses that are hoping to reach the eyes of that consumer. And so in a way, the product that the magazine is producing is not the magazine itself, but the reader of that magazine. And this allows them to drop the price significantly, and it allows more and more people to buy these magazines and read them. And these magazines increasingly start to tackle social and political issues, and they start to expose corruption in government. They start to expose dishonest behavior by factory owners. And as they expose this, it becomes more and more apparent to most Americans the problems and the magnitude of those problems that we're facing as a country. And as more and more Americans become aware, they become more and more insistent that the government needs to do something about it. Now, the government official we most associate with the Progressive Era is Teddy Roosevelt. He is kind of seen as the first progressive pre president, and there's good reasons for that. Uh, he pursued what he referred to as square deal economic policies, the idea that businesses should be regulated in some ways, that there should be consumer protections. He was big on environmental conservation. He's the president that established our national park and national monument system, for instance. Um, he also was the first really first president to see the potential that his role afforded him to actually shift public perceptions. He referred to himself as having a bully pulpit. Now, we tend to think of the word bully as having a certain meaning, but back then, bully just meant good. Um, so what he means when he says he has the bully pulpit means he has the best position of any American. His prominence and the fact that if he wants to talk 
to the American people. If he wants to share his thoughts on something, there is people that are willing to listen. Um, that this provides him to convince an opportunity to convince a new generation of Americans that the government should be responsive to injustice. So he starts speaking out on these issues, and he starts taking his case to the American people. And as more and more people become convinced of this, this translates into things like legislation, right? If more and more people want certain things from their Congress members, those Congress members are going to be more inclined to actually do something about it. And so he does play a prominent role in shifting public perception towards this idea that the government should be responsive to injustice. He was also known as a trust buster, which is just a fancy way of he saying he looked around and he saw the growth of business. Um, you know, I shared that crash course video that talked about Andrew Carnegie and Rockefeller and some of the business practices they were engaging in. Um, he starts to see this and he says, this isn't fair to competition, right? This is, these are monopolies and we need to do something about it. So rather than waiting for Congress to act, he instructs his Justice Department to just start bringing lawsuits against these companies that he views as monopolies. And so for instance, I mentioned that one financial firm owned by JP Morgan that con controlled about 40% of all the industrial capital in the country. Well, he goes after them, and he breaks them up into several smaller businesses. So Teddy Roosevelt rightfully is associated with the progressive era. But a lot of the stuff that he gets credit for um, isn't necessarily entirely all his. So, for instance, one of the most important changes that occurs during his administration is the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act, both in 1906. Now, he was an advocate of this. He spoke passionately and publicly about the need for these two um, pieces of legislation. But really, he was acting, and Congress was acting, largely in response to the publication of a book that happened in the same year, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Now, Upton Sinclair, he was a very radical voice in American pop politics. He was a socialist. He believed that the system of industrial capitalism that had developed in the 1800s was wrong and needed to be overthrown. And he wrote this book that was really meant to highlight the abuses of the American workforce. At the hands of these corrupt and greedy factory owners. This was kind of the main point that his book was trying to make. But in doing so, he also highlighted a few things that really caught the public's attention. And this was um, unsanitary conditions in meat packing plants that were leading to contamination of the food supply. There is one anecdote in there about a person falling into a vat and being made into sausage, uh, as well as rodents and things like this, or sawdust being added to ground meat to make it go further. And because there were no laws stating that you had to tell people what the ingredients were of the foods that you were sending out as consumer goods, Americans were unknowingly consuming this. And this sickened a lot of Americans and led to justifiable outrage. And they put a lot of pressure on the elected officials to take some action. And so Upton Sinclair, he jokingly said after the fact that he aimed to hit Americans in the heart and accidentally hit them in the stomach because he unwittingly acts as the catalyst for the passing of the two most prominent consumer protections of the early 1900s, the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act.